I'd like to welcome our first guest, fellow ADH TV host and regular spectator contributor, the man who kept the red bandana from becoming Australia's first president, Professor David Flint. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. Well, David, it was late August of 1997 when Diana, Princess of Wales, was hounded through the streets of Paris by the press until her car crashed in a tunnel. Now, Diana died shortly after and the world went into a state of shock, having lost the woman who was dubbed the People's Princess. Now, I was only 10 years old at the time, yet I remember where I was when the news broke. David, take us back to 1997 for a moment. What was the mood like toward the press and their behaviour in the aftermath of the princess's death? Was there a sense that they had done the wrong thing, chasing her for, photo uh, for photographs? I happened to be in London on completely different business at the time, and there was an enormous feeling of sadness on the part of the public. But very cleverly, the British turned it against... The British press turned the whole thing against the Queen and they looked for things about which they could attack the Queen. They obviously wanted to cover up their own involvement in the affair. So they attacked the palace for not flying the flag at half-mast over Diana, although, as anybody knows, the royal standard occupies the flag palace put up when the king's there or the queen's there. It's taken down when the king's not there. It's not used for flying, for commemorating people who passed away. So they attacked her about this. They attacked her for not being in London. They attacked her for the boys being up there in Edinburgh and not being in Scotland and not being brought down to London. It was, a, it was an attempt to completely draw attention away from themselves and blame the Queen. And it worked. It worked very well because if you do this, it works at the beginning and the press knows that they can do this at the beginning and they, 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 they were very effective in drawing attention away from themselves. Well, I do remember that in the opening week there was an enormous amount of criticism of the press and you're quite right, they did manage to turn that narrative around and away from themselves. Now, David, it's a, you know, the 90s are a long time ago and I just want to show our, our viewers a comparison about how the story was reported at this time. Have a quick watch. The precise details are still sketchy but the Mercedes 600 carrying the princess, her Egyptian companion, Dodi al Fayed, a driver and a bodyguard, emerged from the tunnel, a complete crumpled wreck. Circumstantial evidence, at least, that the driver lost control while driving at very high speed. According to some reports, at over 100 miles an hour, as he sought to escape from several paparazzi, photographers who specialize in following celebrities and who, on this occasion, were chasing the couple on motorbikes. The bikes were impounded and seven photographers were taken into custody for questioning by the Paris police. They're still being held at the main headquarters. Now, David, we can contrast this to the way the current Princess of Wales, Catherine, the wife of Diana's eldest son, has been treated. The pages of the magazine and social media feeds, they are awash with people demanding private medical information and spinning ever more hurtful and ludicrous conspiracies surrounding AI, divorce stories, her death, and goodness knows what else. Is this behaviour bespoke to the royal family or has there been a more general trend across the board to sensationalise stories? I think you're right, there's been a general trend and the, the royal family being the centre of so much of the news of the world that uh, obviously they're going to attract this sort of issue. Now, she was, she was lauded, she was held up to high regard across the world. Uh, and uh, the press do like to bring someone down if they can. There are elements, I'm not, when I say the press, I mean elements within the press, I don't mean all of the press. And, and obviously they get away with that and they were able to construct all sorts of ridiculous stories which appeared to give some reasons for why we weren't being told the medical condition of the princess. And when she explained it, it was obvious that this was a very reasonable thing, that obviously she would wish to make sure that the children understood what her illness was and that she would be going to recover. They would be devastated by this and this was her primary duty. And we have to remember that these are people, this is a family, and they have their rights too.
Well, I'd like to contrast the situation that happened with Diana to what's happened to Catherine, because it's very interesting to see how the two, the palace had to handle these situations. Uh, I don't know if you remember, but there was a sea of flowers outside uh, the palace after Princess Diana died, and we had the Queen walking through them all, and that was one of the turning points for the media story, when the Queen actually came out and started to break with protocol. Now, David, before the Queen did this and broke with tradition, uh, she made an address to the nation, um, and she actually confronted some of the stories that had been running around. Now, people who were upset by the loss of Diana were asking why there had been no comment, why the flag hadn't been flown at half-mast and why members of the royal family hadn't spoken out. The same kinds of questions we're hearing now. And then, under social media pressure or radio pressure and TV at the time, she came out and gave this extraordinary press conference and it worked. The public accepted her apology and the mood turned on the press once again. Now, when Catherine tried to do this and she put out a photograph of for Mother's Day and then she put out uh, a little video thing, it doesn't seem to have had the same effect. Like, the stories are still going. Do you think that the palace has been rushed into uh, making a comment and has that actually helped? Well, I think she she felt that putting out that uh, photograph would help and it would show that the family were united. And she did what is apparently normal these days. You do make adjustments in photographs. Uh, and, uh, for example, if someone's frowning and you've got a group of people smiling, you obviously try and bring together the photograph that works better in relation to that. People do this all the time. It's like putting on makeup. Well, it's a completely normal thing for I, people. I think I joke with you that the Kardashians literally bend space and time around their waist to make sure that the photographs look perfect for them. But I just want to show you a quick video of the Queen's comments and how people reacted to them. This week at Balmoral, we have all been trying to help William and Harry come to terms with the devastating loss that they and the rest of us have suffered. I think she said it from the heart. She meant it. She sounded very sincere and she looked as though she was very moved. And I think that will satisfy everyone. I think she uh, made up for the um, uh, silence since the accident. I thought she said everything she should have said. I can't think of anything that she left out at all. I think it's completely appropriate. And David, I want to show you just one more quick clip before I ask for your comment. This is what happened to Kate after the commentators, uh, the comments around her cancer rumours. And if anyone owes her an apology, I would suggest it's people like this. Isn't their motto, never complain, never explain? That's and right. And they had her explaining on Twitter? Like... Yes, there was a non-zero chance she died 18 months ago. <laughs> <laughs> they might be weekend at Bernie's in this situation. <laughs> Right. Non-zero. I'm not saying it happened. Right, right. 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 but non-zero. I'm saying it's non-zero. Non <laughs> until proved otherwise, until you see her with a copy of the day's newspaper. <laughs> Internet sleuths are guessing that Kate's absence may be related to her husband and the future King of England, William, having an affair. <sighs> oh, no. Since... <laughs> 2019, according to tabloids back then, when Kate supposedly confronted him about it, he laughed it off saying there was nothing to it. Aha, always a good response when your wife accuses you of cheating. <laughs> well, it was actually a completely untrue story. So final comments here on this story, David. What do you think when you see high-powered TV personalities behaving like that in regards to these stories? Well, they're always testing the boundaries, the boundaries of propriety. And once they've broken through, then they have to all go further. Uh, and you get these sort of shows where where people are mixing news with humour. And, and they're obviously going to continue to do this. We, there's nothing one can do to control that. And unfortunately, the, the princess was the, uh, the object of this at that particular time. It will happen again. But she has a very high standing amongst the people of all of the realms, all of the nations across the world. She's highly respected. She ended her commentary with a note to tell to everybody who's suffering from cancer, not to lose faith, to know that you're not alone. And that was a marvellous message from her. And I think people felt that. And I think that that overcomes all of this trivial, all of this misbehaviour, all of this cheapness, which does nothing for those involved. I think you're 100% right. Now, we've only got a couple of minutes left. We're talking about the press. 
I, you mentioned to me before the show that uh, Albanese appears to have had the longest honeymoon period from the press. What are your thoughts on how they treat him compared to how they treat, you know, Princess Catherine? Well, they go head over heels to forgive him. For like. example, he had the longest honeymoon, then, then he had that very long and ridiculous referendum, very expensive referendum, which cost about twice as much as we spend each year on the prevention and research into cancer. Uh, that referendum was a very expensive referendum. He, he, he was doomed to lose it, I think, from the beginning. And uh, he's, he's been given, he's been given a very soft treatment by the press now, although the government is scrambling in a number of areas, creating enormous problems for the country. And I don't think the press really treat him as they treated former Liberal governments, for example, the way they treated Tony Abbott over quite trivial matters, for example, the recommendation of a knighthood for the Duke of Edinburgh. This was done in about 40 different countries. No one batted an eyelid in the media in reporting that. In Australia, the media turned it into a public scandal. And now, in retrospect, of course, it's as ridiculous as it was then. It was really being used to encourage the internal coup against Abbott. The, the press really needs, the media generally, really needs to treat both parties equally. Oh, can you imagine if Tony Abbott had let all these foreign criminals go and, uh, you know, people wandering in the streets who are rapists and murderers? I mean, the press would never, ever, ever have let that drop until Tony mm. Abbott was out of office. But, you know, no one says a word about Albanese. But thank you so much, David. If you can't get enough of David Flint, you can read him in The Spectator magazine every week or tune into 8HTV and catch up with his show, Save the Nation. David, thank you so much for joining us today on Spectator TV. And thank you, Alexandra, for so encouraging me.